Hello everyone and welcome to the first webinar in the series Social Accountability in the Delivery of Social Protection. This is the first in a three-part webinar series organised by HelpAge International and the International Policy Centre for Inclusive Growth and hosted on the socialprotection.org platform. The first webinar of the series will focus on what social accountability is, the principles and approaches it involves and its application in the social protection sector. We will have three presentations, followed by approximately 30 minutes for questions and answers. Please feel free to submit your questions on the GoToWebinar chat bar, either at the end of each presentation, or you may prefer to wait until all three presentations have finished. We'll have a first round of questions directed at individual speakers, followed by a round of more general questions. If your question is specifically for one of the speakers, please indicate who it's for, along with your question in the chat bar. My name is Alice Livingstone. I am a social protection advisor based in the Global Technical Unit of HelpAge International. And my focus is largely on voice and accountability in social protection. Our first speaker today is Tamsin Aleph, who is an independent social protection consultant. Previously, she held roles with DFID and NGOs, and since 2011 has focused on independent consultancy assignments for the World Bank, UNICEF, and DFID across Africa. Her work has included social protection strategy development, program design and review, as well as assessments and research. She's currently the team leader on a DFID funded research project carried out by Development Pathways on social accountability in the delivery of social protection. Our second speaker today is Emily Kemigisha, who is the country representative for HelpAge International. Emily has been working with care organizations, focusing on issues related to social protection and general policy advocacy since 2007. She is currently coordinating a social accountability project focusing on the Social Assistance Grant for Empowerment program in Uganda. She has a diploma in education, BA in development studies, and a PG in project monitoring and evaluation. Our final speaker today is Jaime Gutierrez, who is the Director General of Planning and Monitoring at Prospera Mexico. Uh, Mr. Gutierrez Casas is um, has been working is uh, sorry the general director of planning and monitoring at Prospera and which is the conditional cash transfer program of the Mexican government and he's previously worked on planning strategies and monitoring activities for the program. Before that, he was deputy general director of foreign real estate management of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. In his 25 years of service at both the public and private sector, Gutierrez Casas has had different assignments in the federal and local government of Mexico. And among his major responsibilities at strategic positions, he's had duties in the Ministry of Communications and Transportation, the National Electorate Institute of Mexico, and the National Bank of Foreign Commerce, Rural Financial, and the Ministry of Finance in the state of Mexico, as well as the Social Security Institute. So I'd now like to hand over to our first speaker, Tamsin Aleph, for the first presentation. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you, Alice. Hello, everyone. Uh, can we go to the first slide? Right, the next one, please. Hello, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So the structure of my presentation is, as Alice indicated earlier, um, really to look at the starting point um, for thinking about social accountability and social protection. So starting with the definition of what social accountability is, then looking at what can we learn from other sectors? Um, what can we learn from so about social accountability as it's been implemented in other sectors apart from social protection? Then we need to think about, well, what's special about the social protection sector? You know, what, what, how and why might we expect social accountability to play out differently in social protection than in other sectors? Um, and, uh, but, and we know 
we're not starting from a blank slate. We know that there is already some um, activity around social accountability and social protection. So what's the current practice? And then what's the framework? I mean, we suggest a framework that we might use to think about social uh, accountability and social protection. Can we go to the next slide, please? And the next one. Right, so social accountability is basically it's an approach to building accountability that's all about citizens. Citizens are the key actors in social accountability, and it's about the extent and capacity of citizens to hold the state and service providers to account and make them responsive to the needs of citizens. So as such, it's a subset of citizen participation. Um, there are other things about in citizen participation that don't count as social accountability. What's special about social accountability is that it's in relation to an existing commitment, which might be a policy commitment, a legal commitment, a commitment in the constitution or a, or a program commitment. Service providers say they're going to do something and social accountability is about citizens looking at whether they have done what they said they would do. And if not, and this is important, ensuring that something happens, that corrective action is taken. Next slide, please. So what we, in our research project, um, have looked at the effects of social accountability mechanisms on both the delivery of social protection and on state society relations. So both um, kind of the intrinsic benefits that come from um, the relationships between citizens and the state and the extra, extrinsic ones, the, the actual the service delivery changes that we might see. Um, today, we're not going to go over this whole research project. We're just looking, as I said, at, at the first step, the development of a framework for looking at social accountability and social protection. Next slide, please. So now we're going to look at what we can learn from other sectors. If we can go to the next slide, please. So there are some really important lessons that we can learn from other sectors before we turn our attention to social protection. Um, first one, and I don't think we can overemphasize this, is that context is key. There is absolutely no blueprint for success in social accountability, and an approach that works well in one context might not work at all in another. And the literature is littered with examples like that. So, you know, if some literature reviews kind of read as this worked here, it didn't work there. This worked here, it didn't work there. Which is very unlike what we're used to in many areas of social protection programming, where we have some very consistent results about uh, regarding impacts. This is linked to the second point, which is that social accountability is essentially a political process. It's not a tool or a mechanism or a project. What we're doing as outsiders is supporting and facilitating, and if we're not careful, messing up an existing system that exists between citizens and state in which different interest groups are making various claims on the state and in which they're more or less likely to get their priorities addressed depending on their power and influence. The, the third important point, and it's important again that as outsiders we don't overlook this, is that for citizens there are costs and risks of engaging in social accountability, um, of attempting to hold the state to account. Of course there are costs in time, um, particularly when we're thinking about poor citizens who are most likely to be beneficiaries of social protection programs, they're busy trying to feed their families. Um, so to engage in social accountability means that you need to take time away from something else and that something else might be important in terms of um, meeting their basic needs. Um, there are risks at the, in the worst case of reprisals from the state, that, that citizens raise demands on the state and the state actually reacts negatively um, and harm comes to those citizens. And very commonly there are risks of elite capture, um, where things may become worse, not better for the poorest and most marginalised citizens. Which leads on to the following point, which is that outcomes of these processes vary for different social groups. And social accountability processes across sectors have struggled to benefit the poor and in particular the poorest. So when we talk about elite capture in terms of social protection, it's not just the elite may not be the elite, the best off the people in the capital, but even citizens who are fairly poor, but not the poorest. The, the interests of the poor and the poorest might not always coincide. And if we empower the poor, that could sometimes be at the expense of the poorest if their interests are not aligned. Um, a fourth point um, is that in social accountability, there isn't an automatic progression 
from information, providing information to citizens, to citizens then voicing their concerns, to states then responding. Um, in very early kind of efforts to build um, social accountability, there were a lot of information campaigns, which is great. The information is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, citizens might not know what to do with that information, and there are all sorts of potential, there were all sorts of constraints to citizens actually voicing their concerns, even if they're well informed. More than that, and very importantly, um, is that even when citizens do voice their concerns, there's no guarantee that states will respond. They might ignore the citizen voice, or even worse, as we said, they might they might respond negatively with reprisals. And the that part of the equation, how states actually respond to citizens' voice, has tended to receive relatively little attention within social accountability, and yet it's just as important as citizen voice. Um, it's not really surprising, coming to my final point on this slide, it's not really surprising given all that, that social accountability turns out to be a long-term process. Um, it doesn't, things don't change quickly, it's a political process. Um, and it's also not linear, that means things don't just steadily get better. Um, they might get worse before they get better, there might be a sudden breakthrough. And so there are, there are actually quite a lot of implications for planning and monitoring the evaluation of the, of the long-term and non-linear nature means we need to think in terms of long time horizons and we also when we're thinking about about monitoring the evaluation need to recognize that there's a limit to what can be counted and that monitoring the evaluation might often need to uh, include qualitative methods to kind of unpack what's really going on next slide please okay so given all that um we borrowed this framework, which was developed some, by some World Bank consultants, to conceptualise social accountability. So we're saying it's the interplay of citizen action, we can see in the bottom right-hand corner, with state action in the top left-hand corner. And states and citizens come together in an interface where they dialogue, um, and those that basic um, interaction between states and citizens needs to be supported by both information, um, which has to be appropriate in content and format and accessible to, to everyone, and also supported by civic mobilization. And that covers various forms of support that might be provided to citizens to mobilize them, in particular the most marginalized, for example, civil society organizations working with citizens um, to raise their awareness, um, facilitate and train. Okay, next slide, please. And the next one. So having said that this is the, you know, how social accountability plays out in general, what we can learn from other sectors, we now come to well, what's special about the social protection sector. Are there ways in which social accountability might play out differently or in, in this sector? So we, there's lots of issues we could look at, but we're highlighting four here. The first one is that social protection beneficiaries tend to be poorer and more vulnerable and more politically marginalised than the average citizen. And we might expect that to be a constraint on citizen action, because we know those citizens face more constraints to action than others. The second point is that social protection by its nature, and we're talking here about um, uh, the, the focus of our work was on cash transfer programs and public works programs that are non-contributory and are therefore either um, generally either poverty targeted or categorically targeted in low-income countries just to clarify that so these programs tend to be individualized the benefits are in, to individual individuals or to households not to the whole community and as such when something goes wrong um, it may go wrong for one household when everyone else might be fine. So if your name is left off the payroll list that affects the household, it doesn't affect the rest of the community. Um, when targeting is done, if there are, if there are exclusion errors, the ha particular households that are excluded are badly affected, but not the whole community again. Um, so I think this is, this is important implications for how easy or difficult it is to mobilize a collective mobilization around social protection. Um, the third point is that in low-income countries, at least institutional capacities for social protection are often relatively weak compared to other sectors. Um, and also decision-making, it tends to be quite centralised around social protection. 
That's coupled with, as we said, um, the citizens involved, the beneficiary citizens, um, are often poorest, and therefore the, their interactions with the state are highly localized. Often these are people who are not able to travel very far, so they're, they're interacting at a very, very local level with local state officials and service providers, but quite often the decisions are being taken at a whole other level because social protection programming tends to be quite centralized. So there's a real disconnect there between uh, the level at which interactions are happening and decisions are taken about many things quite often. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, there are off, very often capacity constraints in the social protection sector, which creates all of these things create challenges for state response. Having said that, we identified an issue that was a potential enabler in the social protection sector, which is um, that some of the many of the services delivered by social protection programs are particularly salient to poor citizens. So by salient, we mean something that's highly visible to a citizen and also affects them very directly. So there are certain things like the quality of education, where the challenge can be that that the quality of, an, of the education children are getting is not always visible to parents. Um, but in our, we don't have that in the set in our sector in that whether or not a household gets a cash transfer is very visible to them, affects them very directly. Um, so I think that can actually be an enabling factor. It can be the fact that these issues can be are highly salient even to the poorest, and in fact, particularly to the poorest, because they're the ones who will miss the cash the most, can actually enable. Um, and promote citizen action in, in social protection even more than in other sectors. Can we go to the next slide, please? So moving on, as I said, to the current situation of social accountability in the social protection sector. Having said all that, well, we're clearly not starting from a blank slate. First thing to bear in mind is that Social accountability as a political process always exists. It's, this, isn't a, this isn't about a project, this isn't something about outsiders do. There always exist informal and cross-sectoral processes of engagement between the state and citizens. And we need to understand these processes, um, these dynamics, if we're going to try to support and strengthen social accountability. In addition to that, in most social protection programmes, there's something happening already in terms of specific interventions. There are usually information campaigns, grievance redress mechanisms are very, very common in the social protection sector. There may also be beneficiary or community committees that have amongst their roles representing um, citizens, beneficiaries, or supporting them with information or something that can come within the social accountability realm. We don't see so much uh, in the social protection sector collective social accountability mechanisms like community scorecards and social audits. I mean, there are some, but they tend to be at pilot scale and relatively rare. But having said that, yes, there's, you know, there's quite a lot going on. Many programmes uh, we found in our research lack a strategic approach. That's to say they're more likely to have a single mechanism, and that mechanism quite often has ambitious objectives. Um, but we don't see, we didn't see across the programmes um, that we looked at across the whole global literature, as well as our case studies, that much attention to how to combine approaches for maximum effect. And in particular, not that much attention to the state response dimension of social accountability. Thank you. Can we go back to the diagram slide, please? So finally, um, having said all that, um, just want to put that all together. So coming back to our conceptual framework, um, thinking about other, there are particular things in each of these boxes that the nature of the social protection sector means we need to give particular attention to in each case. So there's a lot of this in our research and I'm not going to try to go through all of it by any means, but I just thought it might be interesting to just flag a few issues that we might then think about in relation to the particular case studies we're going to look at in this and future webinars. So if we look at the citizen action box, first of all, in the bottom right hand corner. This is about citizen voice. Um, so in relation to social protection, a particular issue that's interesting to think about, which issues are citizens likely to raise through social accountability processes and which concerns might they not raise, even though they're problems, 
might they not raise and why? Um, and one thing that we we sit, saw in, in the programmes we looked at is that citizens tend to raise issues um, that are visible to them and salient to them, but there are many issues that are not so visible to them, such as high level corruption that they might not raise, even if they are objectively important. Um, and also even issues that are salient to citizens, that citizens notice and, and care about, such as inclusion error in their own community. They might know that well-off people in their community are getting a transfer they shouldn't, and that might bother them. But raising that issue is highly sensitive. And there's, a, there's often a high level of, sense of hesitancy around raising that kind of issue. It's risky for citizens to do that. So the implication of that is we need to think about a strategy for accountability that links social accountability with top-down controls. Social accountability is going to be good for addressing certain issues, ones that are highly salient to citizens and aren't too sensitive, but actually other types of accountability might be better for addressing other issues and we need to think about how to link the two. There are also issues of which type of social accountability mechanism is best for which type of issue. Um, and for example, grievance redress mechanisms are often not good for certain issues. They get swamped by many, many, many individual complaints and not able to deal with that. Collective mechanisms might be better in some cases. So you need to think more kind of strategically about which types of mechanisms are best for which types of issue. Um, moving on to the top left-hand corner, state action. Um, the, quest, the key question here in relation to social protection, is citizens voice reaching the decision makers? These decision makers are often not at local level. Um, do local officials that actually directly hear citizens' concerns, do they have the incentives and the capacities and the authorities to ensure that those concerns reach the right level and, and get a response? Um, how best can lo local and higher levels be linked? and how best can incentives and capacities to respond be built. Um, so that requires some quite specific strategies and thinking, not just sort of having meetings at different levels, but actually kind of thinking about how exactly those linkages work. And a final point is that feedback mechanisms um, to citizens quite often lack. So even where states, even where service providers are addressing issues, citizens might not know they've been addressed. And if, if states can't resolve issues, there might be a very good reason they can't, but citizens are quite often kind of left in the dark as to what's happened to their concern. Merely feeding back, merely giving an explanation to the citizen seems often to actually help build trust and relationships between service providers and citizens, so it can be valuable in itself. I'm not going to go through all the other boxes now because looking at my watch, I think I'm pretty much out of time. Um, if I'm not, shout at me, please, facilitator, but I think I am. So I think I'll stop there, um, but just kind of flashing that up as, as our framework and hoping that that is, is useful in terms of helping to think through um, this, this issue of social accountability and social protection. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Tamsin, for a very, very interesting uh, introduction to social accountability in social protection. I'd now like to hand over to our second speaker, who is Emily Kemagisha, and she is the country representative of HelpEdge International in Uganda. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. Okay, my presentation overview is as follows. Uh, I'll be looking at the social protection in Uganda. I will also look at the uh, role of civil society organizations and the citizens in social accountability, uh, as well as the approaches and principles that we are applying as HelpAge International and then the key mechanisms, and we'll, I will end with challenges 
and a threat to social accountability. Next. Okay, um, social, social protection in Uganda uh, is wide, but for purposes of this presentation, I'll just focus on uh, Uganda Senior Citizens Grant, which is under the SEGE program. SEGE is the Social Assistance Grants for Empowerment, and uh, I will keep referring to that acronym SEGE, uh, which is um, a part of the general social protection framework. It is a cash transfer program that we have been um, focusing on to provide social accountability services. So uh, this program started in uh, 2010 as a pilot project uh, covering 15 districts in Uganda, where people aged 65 years and above were targeted, uh, except for Karamoja region, which is extremely vulnerable, where they were looking at people who are 60 years and above. Uh, and because the pilot project was successful, there was um, a demand for rollout, and the government of Uganda announced another phase two rollout, uh, which is uh, from 2016 to 2020, uh, that will be covering 40 more districts. Uh, but in this new phase, it is a bit different, uh, whereby the targeting is unique. Uh, 100 older person, oldest old are being targeted. And this also excludes uh, any older persons that are already uh, benefiting from any other government funded pension. In terms of governance, uh, the program is um, under Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, uh, the, the Project Implementation Unit, and it is under the Directorate of Social Protection. Uh, it is being um, um, managed by Maxwell Stamp in terms of uh, managing as the managing agent for the payments and uh, the bank involved is a uh, post bank that does the payment. Uh, under this program each beneficiary gets 25,000 shillings per month and that is approximately 7.3 uh, US dollars. Uh, however the design is in such a way that uh, this money is not given monthly but rather by monthly. So at the end of every two months, a beneficiary gets uh, 50,000 shillings. Uh, the project is uh, funded by the government of Uganda, but also largely funded by DFID and Irish Aid. Next. Next slide, please. So uh, the previous slide, please. Okay, um, this photo shows uh, a typical example of a pay point. And um, it's not so clear, but you can see the blue van. The blue van is the post bank van. And you can see uh, older persons queuing up to receive their, their pensions. And uh, on the left hand side, there is a, a security officer in uniform who guarantees uh, security for post, not only for post bank, but also for the beneficiaries that receive uh, the money. So the pay points are um, just located in community centers. Next. Yeah, that is also another example of a pay desk uh, in Northern Uganda. And uh, the, you can see the beneficiary, the old lady with um, a red Headscarf, happily receiving her money from the SEGE official. And the three people in blue are post bank officials. And then there's one in green who is a local, a local council leader who provides an oversight role, a physical verification, and uh, uh, a general oversight and monitoring at the ground. Uh, you can see there's uh, another old lady in queue. And um, the post bank official is already verifying her data, uh, biometric data through uh, the computer. So that is what happens. Uh, another person comes in, provides his identification, and um, she or he is verified, and then a given a monthly payment and a receipt. Next.
Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, the role of civil society and, organ and uh, citizens in uh, social accountability for this program. Uh, generally, we empower the communities to demand social security rights. Uh, you will notice that in most communities where such programs are, they will tend to think that uh, social, social security or pension, social pensions are a privilege. And this is also what is happening in Uganda. There's no enough uh, um, communication. Uh, people do not have enough um, knowledge about what happens. So it may be difficult for them to demand their right. But what we do as civil society organization is to empower the communities to demand for what is due to them, to stop taking uh, this program as a privilege, but to know that it is their right and to demand that it is effectively implemented. We do a lot of uh, raising awareness on the social issues and to advocate for change. And when we are doing this, we also do a lot of uh, dialogue, we collect information and dialogue with the SEDGE uh, uh, management to ensure that they provide corrective feedback, they give enough information on what is happening, but also the, the civil society organization have a big role in ensuring that enough information is given to the community. Much as the program may raise awareness, but it may not reach everywhere. And as you may know, in social protection, most of the beneficiaries are really vulnerable. They may not access that information. So, and we all know that information is power. So the more we raise awareness, the more we empower social, uh, communities with information, the more they are empowered to demand what is due to them. Uh, we support uh, good governance, and we ensure that the government and the state uh, are implementing these programs efficiently, effectively. We ensure that there is value for money. We ensure that there is transparency. And as civil society organizations, we work hand in hand with government. We do not do this independently, but we involve them. We try to, we strive to develop and review policies and implement strategies that are that are, that put in place. Uh, programs that are effective and efficient and can uh, protect the, the state, sorry, that can protect the beneficiaries from extreme vulnerability. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, approaches and principles. How do we do this? We tackle this at different levels. Uh, first of all, we have a lot of engagements at different administrative tiers, starting from village level, at sub-county level, district level, and national level. And I will explain this further in the consequent slides on how exactly we do this. But as HelpEdge International, we have structures of edge care organizations in communities, starting from village level, at sub-county level, at district level, and we also have engagements and dialogues at national level. We also engage other stakeholders. We are not doing this alone. We tackle this as um, a collective voice, uh, engaging other civil society organizations. In Uganda, we have what we call a Uganda Social Protection Platform. It is a loose coalition of uh, civil society organizations that uh, have a niche in social protection. So HelpEdge is part of uh, this loose coalition, and together we plan, together we engage government, we work together with government to ensure that appropriate policies are in place, uh, as well as um, uh, to ensure that what the state has committed is uh, really in place, as well as uh, also engaging the bilateral donors, like the ones that are really funding this project. Um, in terms of uh, political support, uh, we all know that social accountability really requires a lot of uh, political will. And for the case of this project, um, we have been engaging the political leaders to ensure that they enact relevant roles, they enact the policies and the budget allocations that will support the SAGE program. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, this program is also funded by the government, 
So there is uh, a certain amount of um, uh, funds that are supposed to be committed by the government. So it is a commitment that they made, but oftentimes the releases do not come in time. And oftentimes the government gives an excuse of, um, of other competing priorities, which, okay, yes, is right, but it is, has been our role as civil society organization, as help to engage the political leaders, to engage the parliamentarians, to ensure that they prioritize social protection. Uh, we also engage the Tekken Co team, and in this case, the SAGE Tekken Co team, to ensure that there's effective implementation. We dialogue and give them feedback. We support the project monitoring. We give them feedback of, uh, from the beneficiaries. And through this, they've been able to improve the situation in the areas where we are working. Next slide. Yes, the mechanisms. How do we do this? Uh, the policy framework. We may all know that it is very difficult to, to, to effectively engage in social accountability unless there is a policy framework. So we ensure that the policies are in place so that we have a benchmark upon which we can hold the government accountable. So Heritage International has been very key in advocating and lobbying for policy uh, pro, uh, social protection programs. Uh, policies that uh, support the SAGE program. And in this case, uh, for example, we have uh, the National Policy for Older Persons that was passed in 2009, and then also uh, the National Social Protection Policy that has recently been passed in 2016. And this SAGE program really fits into those policies. Uh, in terms of budget allocation, uh, we are working closely with the Parliamentary Forum for Social Protection. Like I mentioned before, uh, budget allocation is very key. Uh, there's always resource constraints, so it takes a collective uh, voice, it takes a lot of advocacy to ensure that the parliamentarians, the cabinet members, pass uh, the budgets for social protection. And usually it is a challenge because the world is prioritized other, other issues, the infrastructure, blah, blah but we have been really at the forefront of explaining to the uh, politicians and all other policymakers to prioritize social protection to ensure that stage, uh, the SAGE program uh, really goes on. The rural plan is effectively implemented. Next. Yes, in terms of uh, information and consultation, this is a really a key area that we have uh, been focusing on as Helpage International uh, uh, to support the stage program. We are doing a lot of our public awareness raising and we are doing that through media. Given the low literacy levels and visual impairments uh, of the senior citizen grant beneficiaries, who are in this case uh, older persons, information is primarily given through radios and public meetings. And uh, we have really engaged the media. First of all, we have that to, to involve the media by training them, by creating awareness for them to understand older persons' issues, for them to understand the social protection issues that really affect older persons, for them to understand the SAGE program and its rationale, the impact it is creating, so that uh, they, they support us in our advocacy initiatives. In Uganda, media is very key and they can either raise you up, they can throw you down. So uh, once they raise an issue, once they appreciate an issue, uh, then you are at least assured that it will uh, pick interest from uh, all the policymakers. So we are really working hand in hand with the media personnel in Uganda. Uh, for example, in uh, Karamoja and um, Northern Uganda, uh, Helpage has sponsored two radio programs that are focused on older persons, and the key issue really is uh, the SAGE uh, the surge program. So through those uh, FM radios, there's always uh, information sharing. Information sharing is uh, basically about um, uh, beneficiary recruitments to ensure that the community is well aware on when uh, the recruitments and registrations are taking place, uh, as well as the pay points. In some areas, we find that the turn up uh, for, for the payments is low. Not that the people don't want their money, they are actually disparately 
waiting for it, but uh, information flow at times is a challenge. So as Helpage International, we are beefing the uh, information flow, we are beefing the awareness raising, we are trying to use all the channels, including the media, to ensure that um, the communities, the older persons are aware of the paid days, they are aware of when the payments are going to be paid, they know how much is entitled to them, what time they should come, if uh, they have a complaint, how they should address it. So um, uh, for media, we host, as I said, beneficiaries uh, to, for them to be able to provide enough information to the communities. We also host the beneficiaries to give feedback and share their experiences. Uh, and we also uh, host the leaders of, uh, of the older persons to share information to their peers and ensure that uh, the program is uh, well publicized. People know what to expect and can hold the state accountable for what is due to them. Um, in terms of information, yes, we give information and updates. And we channel this through older persons associations. Like I said, uh, Helpage is a, a network organization. So we have older persons associations that are affiliated to us. We work so closely with them to ensure that um, information is shared because almost all older persons in the areas where we work belong to these older persons associations. So once the leaders have information, chances are high that all the members of all the older persons associations will have enough information about SEDGE, what to expect, how much to be paid, and when something goes wrong, they know uh, how to report and uh, how, to, uh, how to really um, ensure that what is accorded, uh, accorded to them is really good. Um, and then we have what we call the older persons councils. This is a unique structure uh, in Africa. Um, recently in 2016 and also because of our advocacy, finally the older persons elected their own representative. This is a legal structure legally recognized by the government. So uh, these older persons, leaders and beneficiaries provide feedback. So it is a structure that we are using as Helpage. It is a structure that we are trying to build capacity of to ensure that it effectively monitors this search because uh, by virtue of their constitution, the, one of their major roles is to monitor older persons programs. And this is the major older persons program that we have in the country. So we are empowering them to ensure that uh, they take leadership, they monitor the program and provide feedback to the SAGE uh, uh, managers. Now we are mobilizing, uh, grassroots demand for the national rollout of the SAGE. Uh, like I had mentioned before, you will notice that this SAGE is not uh, rolled out nationally yet. And so through the Uganda Social Protection Platform, we are trying to mobilize other, other geographical areas to demand for this program. And uh, because of that, you can see there's a rollout plan for the next 40 districts, but what about the other part of the country? So uh, as a matter of fact, this links me to the next uh, uh, next point. There was a petition by older persons that we supported uh, to the Equal Opportunities Commission, and they, uh, they petitioned government for discrimination, because if other areas, other districts are benefiting, how come the older persons in the other districts are not benefiting? They are saying we are all Ugandans, and if um, social protection, if social pension is a right, then it should be accorded to all senior citizens of the country. So we are really supporting such um, such engagements, raising the voice of older people to be able to demand for what is good to them. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is a picture of um, what I was talking about, so how we are working through media. Uh, in the extreme left, you can see an older person that has really been empowered is uh, speaking and give, sharing her experience on, um, on the stage, okay? And this is a community meeting. On the other side, we usually have a 
the SAGE team and the district leadership to be able to dialogue and agree on some of these issues. Uh, for example, some of the issues that really come up are the delays. The delays, you find um, that the beneficiaries have to wait for so long at pay point. So these are some of the things that really are discussed in such dialogue meetings. And the SAGE team is able to, to clarify and then a way forward is uh, recommended. And we have seen improvements over the time, and especially in waiting time, uh, waiting hours, distance. We see improvements being made after, after our advocacy, after empowering uh, the senior citizens to demand for what is right to them. Uh, on the extreme end, you can see uh, some leaders of uh, older persons. Some of these actually are the elected leaders of older persons council. They are in a studio of an FM radio trying to uh, raise awareness about the stage program and to ensure that uh, the program is uh, well publicized, to ensure that most of their peers have enough information on uh, uh, what to expect from the stage program. Next slide. Yes. Uh, performance monitoring and feedback is also an area that we really capitalize on. Uh, we provide progress reports and we make them available at different administrative tiers, including feedback at parish level, at village level. These are really small administrative units at really local, local level. And where do we get this information from? We get information, most of it is from um, uh, the citizens, uh, and older persons association. We have another structure that we call older citizen monitors. These are older persons ideally that have volunteered to collect data and provide feedback. Uh, this is a, a system and a structure that is used by HelpAge uh, all over the world and has worked successfully. So we train some older persons, in most cases these are retired teachers, uh, retired medical personnel, retired uh, civil, civil servants, and they are really glad to participate in this. So we train them in basic um, uh, data collection methods. We have some tools and questionnaires that they administer to, to the beneficiaries. So we usually have uh, exit interviews uh, at every pay point. And what we, the information we try to collect at this point is um, we are trying to assess knowledge levels of the beneficiaries. How much do they know about this program? And um, how much can they, how, how do they gauge the service? Okay. And uh, after that, we analyze the information and um, give feedback to the SAGE team. And through this, we have seen uh, improvements. Some of the questions that we ask, uh, for example, uh, do, you know, um, do you know how much uh, you're supposed to get every month? Uh, do you know where the, uh, the payments come from? Do you know why you were uh, selected, for example? And you'd be surprised that people are in the system, they are benefiting, but they may not even know why. So, and yet, according to the operation, uh, operational guidance of this program, there's supposed to be a pre prepayment address, okay? Before people are paid, there's supposed, there's supposed to be some address to explain this money is coming from the government of Uganda, uh, and uh, this time you're going to get 50,000 because we are combining um, uh, two months. And if there are areas, which is usually the case, it should be explained as to why you are getting maybe 150,000. These areas are for which month, and this usually lacks, but we have really been trying to emphasize and give uh, information to the stage team that this is really critical and important because once people are in darkness, you give them room to, to, to doubt, you give them room to guess anything. And um, they are also, it also the, the program stands a chance of uh, fraud and corruption because if you do not tell the people, if you're not transparent enough to, to tell the beneficiaries what to expect, then there's a challenge. But that is how we come in uh, and give feedback, we come in and collect information and give uh, back to, to, to the SAGE team. At times they are assuming that, okay, now the program has been running for quite some time, so most of the basic information uh, is really, uh, people already know, but it is their right to know. And for vulnerable older persons, you have to constantly remind them 
about some of these things. Another information that we gather is really about the implementation, the effectiveness and uh, the efficiency. So we have questions around um, the distance, for example, how, how, how long is uh, someone's home to the pay point? Because this one has a bearing on how much they get and how it is spent. It has a bearing on the find that uh, if the pay points are far away from people, then a very big percentage of the money that they're getting will go to transport costs, which is not fair. Uh, so uh, we also ask about how much they got, if the areas are all paid, if they are paid in time, how much do they have to wait at the pay point. And these are crucial areas that we have really been supporting the program and we have seen um, um, some progress. I'm glad that the SAGE team really uh, appreciates this, appreciates uh, positive feedback. And uh, at first, they're always defensive, but these days they can dialogue and tell us what the problem is and ensure that there's improvement. Uh, so, yeah, so those are some of the challenges that we usually find the long distances. Uh, and now, as a result, we find we are trying to, to advocate and lobby that the pay points are more. There's also uh, to shorten the distance. Uh, we also noticed that um, uh, people are waiting for so long at the pay point. And um, we noticed that the problem was through communication. So the, our older citizen monitors, who are our volunteers, are playing a very crucial role in mobilizing, uh, in uh, mobilizing the citizens, informing them at, about the correct time. Because you find at some point uh, the SAGE team uh, wants to pay, say, two pay points in one day. So they would schedule to have uh, a point A at 8 a.m. and then point B at 2 p.m. But if people of uh, point B do not know that the payment is going to be at 2 p.m., they will come at 8 and wait all day. By the time the same team comes at 2, thinking they're in time, people are already sulking, there's already confusion, people are complaining. So this is also one area where we are trying to empower the citizens to help hello, them also. Emily, hello. Hello, Emily. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but um, we're going to have to ask you to wrap up, please, because our next presenter is waiting. Thank you. Sure. sure. I'm sorry. Okay. Next slide. Yes. Yeah. That is just a, a picture of a group of uh, citizen monitors that have been talking about that are collecting data at pay points. Next. Next, please. Okay, grievance redress is also an area that we are trying to uh, to work on. We have uh, enhanced grievance redress mechanisms through multi entry points. Yeah, through multi. This is my second slide. Okay, okay. Yeah, at pay points through the, uh, the leaders and also the citizen monitors. Yeah, we have also supported uh, the legal organizations and trained them to ensure that uh, they provide uh, an alternative redress mechanism. And also the National Council members are also playing a key role in this with our support. Next. Next slide. Yeah, so this is my last slide, and it's just generally about the challenges to social accountability. The previous speaker also hinted uh, uh, somehow about uh, the challenges, uh, so I'll just read through in the interest of time. Uh, the general awareness of rights and entitlements leads to beneficiaries viewing cash transfers as a gift and placing very few demands on program implementers to improve delivery. Uh, there's also limited capacity of, for citizens to hold the government accountable, and uh, especially where health aid is not operating because of uh, resource constraints, we do not operate uh, in all the country in all the country areas. Uh, there's also lack of uh, clear separation between policy making and service provision. For example, the post bank that I was referring to, especially a government-owned uh, entity, so it is difficult now to also hold them accountable. There will always be a blame game. Um, 
Then there's unclear accountability relations due to third party providers. Uh, for example, the change and transition of service providers uh, were always blamed for uh, lead payments. We previously had a telecom com company called MTN, and now we have Postback. So the transition also like things somehow. Uh, and also important here to mention is that social accountability cannot compensate for a poorly designed or implemented program. So for example, this stage program does not cover all eligible older persons in the country. And also there is a big challenge of untimely and insufficient releases from the government. I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much. And sorry for taking long. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you very much, Emily. You had a lot of interesting things to say. Um, and it was great to hear the civil society perspective on social accountability. Um, I'll now hand over to our final speaker. Uh, Jaime Gutierrez, who is the Director General of Planning and Monitoring at Prospera in Mexico. Thank you, Jaime, and thank you, Emily. You can turn your camera off now. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alice. I uh, have paid for the invitation. It is an honor to participate in this webinar in representation of Mexico, my country, uh, and of Prospera, a program of social inclusion of the Mexican government. Uh, Prospera. It's a word that means uh, to flourish, uh, to get better. Um, Prospera is the most important social program. Uh, it, it's a conditional cash transfer program of the Minister of Social Development of the Mexican government that helps the people with greater definitions. We give uh, cash transfers uh, to almost 6.7 million Mexican families in order uh, to strengthen their capabilities in three major areas. Uh, nutrition, health, and education. Additionally, the program uh, promotes the interinstitutional link with the beneficiaries, with the productive projects, labor opportunities, and financial inclusion. The general objective of uh, the program is to contribute to the strength, the effective fulfillment of social rights in order to strengthen the capacities of people in poverty situation through actions that expand their capacities in nutrition, health, and education, as I told before, and improve their access to other dimensions of well-being. Prospera, as I told, uh, has more than 28, 28 million uh, people of beneficiaries in the 11,048 communities of 2,456 uh, communities in Mexico. Also, we cover 6.1 million scholarships around the country. The co uh, this year, I wanted to say that Prospera, uh, we are celebrating here in Mexico, 20 years since Mexico uh, started the conditional cash transfer uh, programs. Prospera was originally designed with three dimensions. If you go, if we see this slide, or components, it's nutrition, health, and education. But in 2014, the uh, Mexican president, Enrique Peña Nieto, and the national coordinator of Prospera, Paul Hernandez, transformed the program into a more social inclusive uh, program, adding a link component of financial, productive, labor, and social inclusion. The nutrition component is aimed to deliver cash transfers to the beneficiary families in order to improve the quantity, the quantity quality, and diversity of the food consumption. The next one, the health the dimension, guide the actions for the health promotion aimed to prevent a disease, as well as encourage of access to health services. Moreover, the education pillar established those initiatives to encourage a major education coverage and full enrollment through the delivery of a scholarship as incentive to stay up and progress through different academic levels. Finally, Prospera has a link component for advising, providing information and promoting the access to beneficiary families to programs of actions of productive development 
income generation, training and employment, uh, final education, access to saving uh, schemes, life insurance, credits, uh, all the above through the international coordination. If we go to the next slide, can we change the, the slide, please? The other one. It's important uh, in the next slide, okay, uh, to make a description of each of the uh, link of vinculation components, because this is the reason of the transformation of Prospera into a more social uh, inclusive program. The productive uh, inclusion, inclusion is the component for an institutional articulation for more than 15 productive programs for the empowerment of beneficiaries with more job op options or entrepreneurship projects. The financial inclusion, in coordination with the Minister of Finance of Mexico, was designed with a, a scheme of financial support for the families with products and services of savings, uh, credits, insurance, and final literacy uh, and education. The labor inclusion ensures uh, forms to allow the people to have training and better capabilities to enter into the formal workforce. Finally, uh, the social inclusion component, the last one, is seeking a universal, uh, a universal access to the human and social rights of all the, the families. Uh, part of the social inclusion component is a mechanism of hearing right, which allows the people, uh, the citizens for, of Prospera, to discuss a complaint with the uh, legal staff of our office in Prospera in case for the suspension of their cash transfers and services. If we go to the next slide, Prospera uh, design is uh, aligned with the National Development Plan, which contains the principles of the social protection system. The goal number two uh, in this National Development Plan uh, that we call uh, Mexico Incluyente in, this, in Spanish, that in English is Exclusive Mexico, established that the following aim is strengthen the follow the development of capabilities of the families in order to contribute and improve of the life. The evaluation of social development policy in Mexico called Coneval. Some of the uh, achievements in these uh, years of the social protection are uh, that 54 million Mexicans are affi uh, affiliated to the popular health insurance, extensive coverage of the social programs within a strategy of focal focalization for the most vulnerable inhabitants, and uh, the health expenditure uh, has shown a constant growth uh, in Mexico uh, GDP. If we go to the next one, well, we can change to the other one, yeah. Accountability uh, with the Mexican government refers to the process in which citizens follow and evaluate the responsibility intervention of public servants through mechanisms uh, such as transparency and social accountability. Accountability is one of the cross strategies uh, within the National Development Plan Specifically, we both call uh, close and modern government. The legal framework uh, on the issue is in the Article 134 in the political constitution. This topic is already a fundamental element of any democracy and is currently manifested in the international context. The new information, uh, the technologies enable uh, to access of communications of an effective as well as efficient and transparent work for the federal government. If we go to the next slide, in Prospera, uh, we have a different mechanism. Uh, we go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have many um, different mechanisms of social accountability. Today, I, I will explain three uh, principles of them. The community promotion committees, uh, sentinel points, and the office for the citizen uh, attention. The first one, the community promotion committees, are the figures that enable social protection actions to ensure that the program activities are carried out under the concept of transparency and accountability, promoting the social rights of beneficiaries and society aiming uh, to participate actively in the coordination, in the planning, the execution, evaluation, and supervision of the, the social policy. In Prospera, the beneficiaries participate in the social accountability through the participation as members of the community promotion committees. The community promotion communities uh, and the beneficiaries participants are regularly similar to the guidelines for the promotion and operation of the social controllers office 
in the federal social development programs issued by the Minister of Public Administration, which follows of the transparent activities of this uh, public that we serve. Um, the families, the beneficiary leaders, known as the vocales uh, in Mexico, of that committees promote the active participation for the community with the transparent framework of Prospera, taking into consideration the right uh, to the uh, uh, communication among the beneficiaries that their families and their operations and legal staff of Prospera. There is a very close uh, relationship between vocales and the people here in Prospera. The goal of uh, the community promotion committees is to determine the promotion activities of social accountability for those activities for the public servants of the National Coordination of Prospera and its office around the country. In addition, uh, the committees follow up those activities for the local governments uh, support the operations of Prospera, assuring the transparency and the capability. It's, this is very important for us here in, in Mexico because this gives uh, the strength for the program. In summary, the social accountability mechanism of Prospera employs many actions with the legal framework, with operation rules, and uh, following the, uh, these uh, features, uh, these four features, that's the citizen's participation mechanism, accountability oriented, transparency promotion, and the, and the last one, and it's very important uh, right now here in Mexico, is the fight against corruption. If we go to the next slide, the next one. Uh, can we change the slide, please? Another mechanism of Prospera uh, in terms of social accountability is the story and survival uh, sentinel points, which has been carried out for more than 50 years. But uh, I'm going to explain what sentinel points. This is a mechanism that we introduced here in Prospera. Uh, and helps for social accountability uh, to know the perception of the people of the families uh, in Prospera staff uh, through a statistic and representatives. Uh, it's a, a, a survey that we uh, make here uh, inside Prospera. Uh, by definition, it's a geographic area formed by a locality for localities where the survival follows of the services in health, in education, in nutrition, and link incentives received by the beneficiaries and their families. The main goal of the Sentinel point, uh, Sent uh, Sentinel point is to obtain relevant information about the key process uh, of Prospera through the measure of the operation attributes of the program and the satisfaction of the service from the perspective of the beneficiaries of the partners. Uh, this includes the Minister of Health, Minister of Education, uh, Minister of Finance, uh, among others, and the, all the Prospera staff. The scope of Sentinel Points is to carry uh, uh, out a survey once a year nationwide with a representative sample in five different levels, country in all the 32 states of Mexico, urban areas, rural areas, and the people uh, uh, indigenous areas. If we see the, the next uh, map, uh, uh, we, we can see the map of Mexico and the points uh, that we local see these sentinel points and the survive we have in this point the, the survive finally uh, the office for citizen attention the next one is another example for the efforts of prospera to achieve social accountability this special administrative uh, unit is in charge of the actions carried out by the operational staff in the office of prospera nationwide as the first uh, contact between prospera and their beneficiaries uh, the families and the citizens uh, we have the general objective is our is to ensure uh, the families of Prospera uh, that can be informed about the operation and characteristics of the program. The Office of City Attention is in charge of the of this efficiency and quality attention of these following uh, issues: the request of the service, as we see in this uh, slide, the disagreements on the attention and service received, and also the complaints uh, about the service, the service and the personal. All the above are received through the different means to warranty respect for the hearing rights. If we go, uh, go uh, to the last uh, to the last slide. slide, please. This is the the final one. Uh, we say that, uh, as I told, in this year, Prospera, uh, we're celebrating 20, 20 years of the program. Uh, it's a very good program, and I invited. It, to all the people that we are listening to us 
to enter to the Prospera uh, page, uh, prospera.com, uh, and to learn more about uh, the programs and the things that we have here in Mexico. Thank you very much, Alice. It's an honor to participate with you here in this uh, web seminar. Thanks very much, Jaime. Thank you for your time and a very interesting presentation about the, the Prospera program in Mexico. Um, we have about 20 minutes for questions, and we already have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so we have some questions that have been directed specifically to Tamsin. So if Tamsin, you'd be happy to take those questions first of all. Um, so the first question that we have, uh, I'll give you two questions, Tamsin. So the first was, what is the best way to evaluate social accountability in cash transfer programs? And the second one, uh, sorry, so that question is coming from Mariana Hoffman. And the second question was, how was the social accountability framework you discussed different from the rights-based approach to social protection where citizens as rights holders claim their rights from the state? And that's from Addis Yipsa, Yipsa work. Hi, Tamsin, if you could, uh, yeah, if you'd like to take those questions, please. Thank you, Alice, um, and thank you, questioners. Um, on the question about evaluation, first of all, um, there's a lively debate on this, how best to evaluate social accountability in general across sectors, and I don't pretend to have a definitive answer. Though I do, there are a few ideas that I can throw out. Firstly, I think, going back to some of the things I said about the process of social accountability, how it's a political process and how it's not linear, so things might even get better before they get worse. Um, I think that points to the limitations of trying to monitor and evaluate through very sort of few and very quantitative indicators. Uh, what it suggests is, for example, you know, that randomized control trials, for example, might have a place, um, but that we probably need also complementary approaches that unpack um, the political process and understand, seek to understand trajectories of change and the reasons for the change, the process, the causation of different changes. And in doing that, we can understand what's happening and why um, and have a more effective um, form of monitoring and evaluation. Some of the kinds of methods that might be useful to that are things like process tracing, when you actually sort of track what happens and why, um, you know, who raises the concern and what then happens next, who does that get referred to, what do they do and why, uh, at some point does the process get blocked, why, and sort of get some insight into some of the, the incentives and disincentives um, in terms of addressing the issues that might be being raised by citizens. Um, the most significant change technique that some of you are probably familiar with might also be interesting from the point of citizens, what's been the most you know, significant change that has happened and trying to kind of pull out um, that at kind of first community level and then kind of taking it up levels. So I think those sorts of approaches might have something to add um, in terms of evaluating social accountability and social protection. Um, the second question, I think the social accountability framework I say, was compa entirely compatible with the rights-based approach to social protection. Um, I think, I don't know, it might be helpful if we can to kind of just go to that slide, the, the diagram slide, if that's possible. Um, but what the, what the framework suggested was that um, there are two key elements of social accountability. So it's partly about citizen action, so that would be the part of citizens claiming their rights, but it's also about state response and that state response is just as important as citizen action. Um, so I think that's uh, important to bear in mind that we, in social accountability, yeah, here we go, that the state action, citizens coming together in an interface with states claiming their rights, but also what happens next? is a really important question. If we just say it's about citizens claiming their rights and stop there, we haven't encompassed what social accountability is all about. Um, coming on to the rights issue, if we look at the information box, um, information awareness, it's not just about citizens having information, but the extent to which citizens see social protection as a right or a gift 
is important in terms of how likely they are to actually raise a concern when things go wrong and we found if citizens see it as a gift as, as Emily suggested um, you know they don't then necessarily they, feel they have the right to complain you know it's they just feel grateful so right, that is an important element that they perceive social protection as a right is an enabler of social accountability and uh, we see that in some contexts where people do feel they have a right that so that 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 it helps the social accountability process, but it's not in itself sufficient. I think that's important. Coming to the civic mobilisation box, for example, we found in South Africa that despite there being a really a strong rights-based framework, social protection rights are underpinned by a legal framework, and most people interviewed feeling they had a right to social protection, nonetheless there was a low propensity to raise to, for citizens to voice concerns. Um, they weren't organised in that way and they and they, they kind of couldn't quite see their way to how to organise. So there seemed to be a lack of civic mobilisation of citizens in that context. So I think all the, the basic point is that all of these elements are important um, and, and that, you know, citizens simply being aware of their rights is not enough in itself, however important it is. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tamsin. And okay, we've got um, two questions now for Emily in Uganda. Emily, if you'd like to to put your camera on and your voice on. Um, so the first question we have for Emily is from Vera Tum, and he's asking how does help age in Uganda empower communities demand, to demand social security rights? And the second question has come from Paul Mondoa Ngoba. And he is asking a question relating to the payment system and whether the payment strategy is planned to be changed to guarantee greater accountability. I think he's asking for particularly in the context of mobile money being quite well established in Uganda. So there's two questions for you, Emily. Thanks. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, the first one, I think, uh, yeah, I appreciate the question. Very good question. I think Vera, at some point, she said uh, she lost connection. But uh, I think I talked uh, through most of these ways we are doing, um, especially the sensitizations. We are empowering through sensitization about their rights, uh, but also organizing them in. Um, uh, older persons associations for collective voice uh, and leadership. Uh, for the second question, um, I agree. It seems like uh, mobile money would be more efficient. Uh, and in the first phase, actually, we are using a mobile money te telecom company, MTN. But later, uh, the government changed to Post Bank, and the reason they gave, uh, they verified and assessed and found that post bank was more cost effective and there was more or better value for money. However, there is a, a redesign review process that is going on. And um, I know that is one of the areas that may be uh, changed or redesigned to ensure effective uh, implementation of this project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. Sorry, just putting my camera back on again. Thanks a lot, Emily, for answering those questions. Um, we do have some other questions which have come in sort of more general ones. Um, okay, actually, no, there's, one, there's another specific one for um, Jaime. So, actually, Jaime, we've got two for you. So, if you'd like to turn your camera and your mic on, and if you could um, take these questions. So... Um, the first, thank you very much. So the first, que the first question is quite a broad one around social protection, but perhaps in your answer you could talk a bit around sort of the social, the link to social accountability. So the first question was around whether Mexico has a national framework for social protection, and what are the links with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a question around how um, Prospera is is funded and how the targeting is done i mean they're, they're quite broad questions around social protection but 
perhaps in your answer you could just make the link to sort of social accountability as well and then the second question we had was what are the most common grievances and complaints in the Prospera program so sorry so the first set of questions was coming from you Raj Basnet who's in Nepal and the second question was from Charles Knox Vidmanov thank you okay I'll perfect yeah thanks with regards to Nepal, uh, uh, okay, we have the we have framework here in Mexico. Uh, first, the, uh, is the first uh, the national constitution. I would say that the first constitution in the world that uh, put this uh, social rights in the constitution was Mexico. It was uh, around uh, 1900, 1910. And this constitution, uh, it's uh, we have a general law of social development that was implemented in 2003 and uh, every six years we have a national development plan that everything is aligned with the constitution, the general law and the national development plan is uh, aligned with uh, social uh, objectives. Uh, the, the things uh, is to fight uh, poverty. Uh, I have to tell that in Mexico we have uh, 120 million people and 55 million people are in the poverty line and Prospera work with 28 million like, like I told in the presentation. Uh, money for the program as a question uh, comes from the taxes uh, and I think it's around one percent of the national gross product that uh, the money that comes to Prospera to the families of Prospera uh, and uh, I say that the social accountability the importance is uh, as my, as I see the system of the citizens, that gives trust, that gives uh, confidence, and in Mexico we have a well-established proce uh, process that gives the families transparency. Um, and uh, the other question, uh, uh, well, uh, we have to fight against poverty here in Mexico, and the idea is to reduce the gap uh, of inequality with the Mexican society. The goal is to reduce extreme poverty, uh, and in the present of uh, this administration of the president, of this president Enrique Peña Nieto, we have reduced uh, two million people uh, in the poverty line. And I think, uh, well, Prospera is a very uh, well evaluated program around the world. Uh, the other one, um, the target of the beneficiaries through the uh, uh, we make a, a identification pro, a process, uh, we go directly to the their homes and uh, we make a survey uh, of the social, uh, economical, uh, how are they, they in, in that part, in that part and we, every year, uh, we incorporate families to the program uh, according to this survey. Uh, that's that's the, the main question, so there's another question. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so so the other question, sorry, the other question I think we had was what are the most, um, was around uh, the most common grievances and complaints that come from the beneficiaries of Prospera? Los complaints? Mm -hmm. uh, the main complaints, uh, are from the the way they receive the money. It is very, it is very difficult in a, in a country like us uh, to go to every place. We try to establish a mechanism with other institutions like Pansefi to send the money to the people. And the problem with uh, the, the, the main complaints are uh, according to the people because it's uh, very difficult for the people to go two, three hours from the, their homes to the place that we uh, give the money to, to them and we're uh, with all the government try to establish a links to help the people and to uh, uh, better this process of uh, give the money to the people that's a, the main complaint is about how the money comes to them okay thanks very much thank you Jaime um, okay so we've got uh, some other questions uh, um, okay, we've got some other questions coming in as well. 
Um, thank you, Jaime. The next question we've got is for Emily. So, the, uh, Jaime, if you'd like to, you can turn off your, your camera and your, your voice now. And we've got a question for Emily. And this has come from Edward Ampraswum. And he's asking, um, how is targeting done in SAGE? And does the involvement of local actors in targeting and payments predispose the programs to elite capture and local power dynamics? So that's a question for Emily in relation to the SAGE program. Thanks, Edward, for the question. Um, targeting is uh, definitely done um, by age, and we are getting information from the National Information Registration Bureau, where everyone's biometric data is captured. So, uh, in this phase two stage, we find when we are targeting the 100 eldest older persons. So it is a bit automatic uh, that from every sub county that is a list, a list of um, um, the older persons, and they will always get 100 oldest. So, for example, if one dies, then the 100 and first person will be replaced. So the targeting is uh, uh, enrollment is done after every year, uh, general enrollment, uh, because uh, the design is in such a way that every other year they add uh, 100 people. Uh, the role of uh, the locals in targeting is, of course, uh, about verification, because we had also a challenge of people not uh, being aware of, uh, of their real age. So the local leaders also play a role in this. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. I think we've just got time for just one final question, um, which is coming from you, Basna, in Nepal again. And he's just asking whether the Prospera program would be termed as something which is kind of demand based or supply based. And he's, yeah, he's asking about whether citizens are demanding for social protection in the case of, of Prospera. Uh, Jaime, if you are able to take that question. Yes, yes, Alice. Uh, well, I, I would say that uh, Prospera is it's more than uh, about the identification of the families. We do a, sur a survive of the families, then we go uh, identify them. We go to the Minister of Finance in Mexico, uh, we ask for budget, and they uh, every year uh, they give us uh, money uh, to attend the families. Um, and as I told before, 54 million Mexicans uh, were affiliated to the pop uh, popular health insurance, and we have an extensive uh, coverage of the social programs uh, with a strategic of focalization of the most vulnerable inhabitants in the country. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for answering the question. That was just the one question there. And I think that will have to be our last question. And yeah, we've run out of time now. So um, I'll be bringing the session to a close. So just to thank um, Tamsin, Emily and Kame for presenting today. And thank you also to our audience for participating in the webinar. And just to mention that we have uh, the next webinar on social accountability in social protection will be on the 1st of March and then on the 29th of March. And they'll be focusing on sort of different topics related to social accountability. So if you want to find out more what the webinars are about, um, then you can stay up to date on the webinar series by registering on socialprotection.org or by following them on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. So thank you everybody for joining today and have a good day. Thank you.